Okay, thank you. Welcome back. Good afternoon. So, in the first part, we approached F theory from a type GB perspective, and we showed that the profile of the exodilaton is equivalent to an elliptic vibration over the physical compactification space dn. And importantly, in this language, the elliptic fiber is really an auxiliary object. It's an auxiliary curve whose complex structure encodes this physical field tau. Now, as we said, there is an alternative way of approaching such F-theory compactifications via M-theory duality. So we'll be discussing from M-theory to elliptic vibrations now. So the second route, not via the seven brains, but from the M-theory directly. Which in particular will make, give a different perspective on the structure of the elliptic fiber. So by M-theory, we will be meaning um, essentially the long wavelength limit of 11-dimensional supergravity. So we consider 11-dimensional um, supergravity with bosonic field content the 11-dimensional metric GMN. The three-form gauge potential, this is crucial, three-form gauge potential C3, which is invariant under a shift C3, oh, uh, which enjoys a gauge symmetry, C3 goes to C3 plus D lambda 2. So it's a higher form gauge potential, and consequently, the field strength G4 equals D3 is gauge invariant, clearly. So the effective action in 11 dimensions is at the bosonic level, 2 pi over the characteristic length scale in 11 dimensions to the power of 9. And then we have the um, Einstein-Hilbert term, we have the kinetic term for the gauge potential. We have a chern simons term, which is of some importance. And then there are higher order terms, which in fact will also feature later on, plus order 2 pi over L11 to the 3, which come with six extra powers of length, as we will be discussing briefly. So that's the effective action of 11D supergravity. And this will couple, in particular, to the M2 brain. So that's a second key player, not only the three-form potential, but also the M2 brain, to which C3 couples electrically. C3 couples electrically to M2 brains. So the action of the M2 brain has again a DBI type part, 2 pi over L 11 cubed times square root minus determinant, plus then the electric coupling, of course, integral C3. And the duality is now a fiber-wise duality of the well-known duality between M-theory on a torus, this is where this torus appears, and type 2 B string theory. So let's consider first M-theory in that sense, so 11D subra on a torus T2, which now we think of in down to 
Earth terms as the product of two cycles, S1A times S1B. Just reviewing this, this is well known, where S1A we take to be the M-theory circle. So S1A is the M-theory circle of radius Ra and associated with coordinate x. So it's not the coordinate x of the Weierstrass model, but let me just now introduce a coordinate x. So this means that, of course, as we take the circle R, uh, the, and the, the radius Ra to zero, we approach type 2a theory on the space um, R18 times S1b. So as our a goes to zero, we approach in the usual fashion type to a string theory on R18 times S A, where crucially the component of the metric along the circle direction, G1111, so to speak, is related to the dilaton of type to A, and G11 and the remaining ones will translate into the C1. Raman Raman potential of type to A. Question? That's right. Thank you very much. So G um, X X will be related to phi in type to A and G X and then the remaining components along R18 times S1B. This is related to C1, the Raman Raman one form potential in type 2a, according to the usual type 2a M theory duality. And then the second standard step is to now perform a T duality from S1b along S1b to go from type 2a to type 2b. Tedialize on S1B. So we get type to B string theory on R18 times the dual circle with dual ra radius RB tilde equals LS squared over RB. And in particular, So S1B has coordinate Y and in particular C1 in the Y direction under T-duality becomes C0 because we remove the lag along which we T-dualize for the raman raman fields. So as our B tilde goes to infinity we therefore recover type to B on R19 where C1 in the Y direction, in the original Y direction becomes C0 of type to B. And also the other fields transform in the usual way under T-duality. So M theory on R18 times T2 is dual in the limit where the radius of Ra goes to 0 and Rb goes to 0 to type to B on R19. again? Um, such that the exit it depends on, uh, well, if I, if I don't take it, well, it, it depends on what the, no, not necessary. Um, this will then affect the exodilaton in type to B, and if it diverges, it diverges. 
So it will be okay to have diverging exadilitons. So there's a more precise statement that I'm going to give now that should um, address this. So this is just the, the easy way to memorize things, but one can do this much more in, in much greater detail and, and write down this, this dimensional reduction of M theory on a torus in great detail, um, introducing um, the metric on the torus and following in, in detail how, how one gets from M theory to 2A and then back to type 2B. This has been done in many places and beautifully reviewed in particular by Deneff's lectures, Lesouch's lectures. So I'm just quoting this because otherwise I would have to just copy it because it's perfect. So you can read this up in those lectures on page 24, 25. And you find that maybe I should yeah, I'll stay here. So if we start, no, let me go over there. Sorry. So if we start with M theory on R18 times T2, where the torus T2 has complex fracture tau equals tau1 plus I tau2 and volume V, then this is dual to type to B on R18 times S1B. Um, I guess I should call this S1B tilde, indeed with exodiloton tau equals C0 plus I over Gs. So the complex fracture translates directly into the exodiloton. And we have an Einstein frame metric ds squared equals type to B in the Einstein frame. This is the flat metric in R18 plus Ls to the 4 over V, V being the original volume, times dy tilde squared where y tilde is a coordinate on S1B tilde with periodicity 1. So you have to keep track of the factors and, and factors of LS and do the duality um, um, in detail. So in particular this shows that as we take V to zero, V being the original volume, the prefactor here of the Y squared goes to infinity. So this means that in this limit, the fact that Y tilde had periodicity one doesn't matter anymore. So this becomes just then in that limit, the 10 dimensional type to B action. And it, it is in this sense how the complex structure and the volume in M theory enter. So if the complex structure is such that there's a, um, there's a degeneracy, this means then that the exodiliton would degenerate, like is expected in particular in presence of seven brains, where we have these logarithmic problems and also others. So as v to zero, we recover type to b on R19. And I should say as v to zero, while LS stays fixed, we recover this type to be. This is sometimes important to take into account when it comes to really tracing back how the duality works.
Okay, so this is this fiber-wise duality between, or this is just this duality between R18 on type C2 M theory and type 2 B. And it's useful to keep this in mind, this statement, that really this extra circle comes with a factor of 1 over V, because that uh, implies then what happens in the limit V to 0. And again, a li little bit of work is required to do so. It's two pages. We can read it up there. So now the logic is to promote this to a fiber-wise duality. So suppose that the M-theory space-time is, in fact, a torus vibration, and fiber-wise do this duality to type 2b. So we would promote this to fiber-wise duality So we would have M theory on R one eight minus two N times Y N plus one complex dimension of an elliptic vibration, where Y N plus one is an, an elliptic vibration, so pi E tau Y N plus one over B N an elliptic vibration, or in fact, a torus vibration is sufficient. We'll discuss the difference briefly in a second. This is a torus vibration. Then this is dual to um, Type to B, indeed, on R18 minus 2N times BN, so times S1B tilde times BN with um, metric DS squared equals. D S squared R one eight minus two N plus L S four over V D Y tilde squared plus D S squared B N. And the complex structure Tau of E Tau which in general can now vary because we're looking at an elliptic vibration, maps into um, the exodeleton tau of type 2b. And in particular, note that we start on this side with M theory on a space. But M theory without any further addition. So in order to preserve supersymmetry, this space Y n plus 1 has to be Calabi Yau. To preserve SUSY, the same amount of SUSY as uh, in the, from the 2B perspective, this is then automatic. Uh, in M theory, without further ingredients, so no, no particular backgrounds or anything, um, y n plus 1 must be Calabria. So we see again that the elliptic vibration has to be Calabria space, even though the derivation is slightly differently. From the M-theory perspective, it's immediate. From the 2B perspective, we had to work much harder to arrive at this. And there's, there are two points I'd like to stress in this context. The elliptic fiber, from the M-theory perspective, is part of space-time. So in the M-theory, the elliptic fiber is just part of the full space-time on which we compactify. 
And so one of its cycles goes away, one of its circles goes away by going to type 2a, and the other circle becomes part of the extended type 2b space-time, the extended part, in the limit where the volume goes to zero. So, E tau, the elliptic curve, or the elliptic fiber, is part of space-time in M-theory, and one of its directions becomes part of space-time in type 2b via this duality. This is very different from the role the elliptic fiber played in our type 2b derivation, where it was just an auxiliary, auxiliary curve. And the second part, if we just consider M-theory on that elliptic vibration, we don't care about F-theory at all, then both the volume and the complex structure of the torus fiber play the role of a dynamical modulus, as always. However, the F-theory lift or the F-theory limit is the one where the volume V goes to zero, so it is only in this F-theory limit that we forget about the information of the volume. So in that limit, this will not correspond in F-theory, on that dual side, it will not correspond to geometric modulus of the F-theory compactification. Only the complex structure, tau, will correspond to a modulus or to a field in the type to be picture, namely precisely the exit dilator. So in M-theory, both tau and V are dynamical moduli, dynamical moduli. So in the F theory limit, which is the limit V to zero, um, only tau um, is retained. Only the tau information is retained. So, what we, what we do in this approach is we compare, say, an F-theory compactification. Say, let's take N to be 3. Then we would have an M-theory compactification to three dimensions. And we compare it with the type 2B compactifications on three dimensions times a circle. And in the limit where this circle goes to infinity, this is the limit where the volume of that fiber shrinks to zero. So that's another way, useful way of putting it. So an equivalent formulation of this duality would be that if we consider the effective action of M theory on an elliptic vibration Y n plus 1 in R1, 8, minus 2 n, with the volume of the elliptic fiber being some modulus of the vibration, the modulus V, then this is the same. This theory in R1, 8 minus, n, uh, 8 minus 2n is the same theory as type 2b on Bn, being the base of the space, further compactified on an extra circle, S1, whose radius is 1 over V. circle reduction of type to B on Bn in R1 8 minus 2n times S1 B tilde with the radius R B tilde equals Ls to the 4 over V. Square root. So type 2b reduced on a circle is dual to M theory on that space, on the elliptic vibration. If the radius goes to infinity, the volume of the elliptic fiber goes to zero on that side. 
and then the information about the volume is lost, and in that, in that limit, it's not a dynamical model. Okay, questions? In not really yet. So indeed, indeed. So well, we so we know that since tau is varying, there must be a source to it. So we will be interpreting this as a type to, uh, as a seven brain language. So in, on the type two B side, we will the type two B theory is the one that we discussed. But in the M theory picture, there are no seven brains at all, and we will see where the gauge degrees of freedom on the seven brains come in now from the M theory perspective. This will now be the the job to understand. Please. Yes, now. Very good, very good. Okay. Okay, and we will do this now in chapter two. Now that we've introduced the key players, we'll discuss the hands in hand, hopefully, hand in hand, hopefully, the physics and mathematics of elliptic vibrations. And we'll go slow. We start with the smooth Weierstrass model, and then we find our way ahead. So, an elliptic vibration is a torus vibration with a section. So, an elliptic vibration is a torus vibration with a section, sometimes called zero section. as zero, and such a section is a, in general, meromorphic map from the base to the fiber. So in general, meromorphic, here to begin with, even holomor holomorphic in the smooth Weierstrass model, map from the base to the fiber. So a torus vibration just has a torus in the fiber. But for the elliptic vibration, so the elliptic curve is a torus with a marked point. An elliptic vibration is a torus vibration with a marked point everywhere. And that marked point everywhere is precisely the image of the section. So the section, um, yes, a section is a map from Bn to the elliptic fiber. So every point in the base B is mapped to some S0 or to, or to some, um, okay, what, what, what's a good notation now? Let me call it like this, is a sigma of B in E tau. And this sigma of B is the origin, the marked point on the elliptic curve. So, to every torus vibration, so a priori it is sufficient to have a torus vibration for M theory and also for F theory. However, to every torus vibration, one can associate an elliptic vibration called its Jacobian, possibly at the cost of this vibration being singular in higher co-dimension 
such that no Calabi-Yau resolution of the singularities exists, which, however, is not a problem. So to every torus vibration, that's a fact, one can associate a possibly singular Weierstrass vibration, uh, um, elliptic vibration. So there are therefore two possible perspectives one can take. Either one says, I'm happy from now on to discuss only elliptic vibrations, possibly at the cost of dealing with those singularities, which I may not be able to resolve into Calabi-Yau space. Or I say, I should really be looking at a torus vibration and study those. Both is in the F-theory limit equivalent, not in the M-theory. And for simplicity, I will from now on, so to speak, I implicitly take the second point of view. I will now be focusing on elliptic vibrations, which is still maximally generic, as long as I allow for those singularities. And I will refer you to Miriam's lecture on Friday, where she will be discussing torus vibrations as well. So for simplicity, we assume for now the existence of a section and again this is actually not really a restriction as long as we are happy with having those singularities for the physics of torus vibrations without see the lecture by Miriam on Friday. So the upshot is one can get the same physics, of course, by either looking at these possibly si at these singular Weierstrass models, singular elliptic vibrations, or the, or the torus vibrations. In both cases, it gives the same physics in F-theory. Not in M-theory, but in F-theory, they are the same. That's why, for us now, it's not a restriction to go to this. And we will see where the where we will now see where this where the section comes in, where the existence of the section comes in, and what it means. Is this clear? The logic, at least, statement. No. Question. Are you okay? No, because no, you you raised this. What was that? Was that clear? Okay. Okay. Thank you. I mean, sorry. I mean. Um, okay. So every elliptic vibration every elliptic vibration is birationally equivalent to a Weierstrass model. So every elliptic vibration can be written in this Weierstrass form, but by up to birational equivalence, this means up to differences in higher co-dimension possibly. Is birationally equivalent to a Weierstrass model. And by rational equivalence means it's isomorphic up to loci in higher co-dimension. Higher co-dimension may differ, but for this purpose it's fine. So it could... The ambiguity is that there could be different types of fibers. Oh, say, suppose you have a base, a two-complex dimensional base, just then at points co-dimension 2, there could be different types of fiber in the um, Weierstrass model compared to another representation of that model. And we will be classifying or reviewing the classification of the fibers in the, in the Weierstrass model in, in elliptic vibrations which are not in Weierstrass form. There may be extra types of fibers in addition to that. But this happens in higher co-dimension. So away from those, the, 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 the models are, are, are the same. And in the F-theory limits, they are all equivalent. Yes. Um, in, the, in that case, indeed. 
So uh, that is then a technical question for how to how to deal with those singularities precisely. So that's why it is then useful to to pass on to the torus vibration. But the set is this, I mean it's one is not losing a model. One may have a representation of the model that may be dip more difficult or uh, inconvenient to describe. Indeed. Um, the latter. It's a degeneration of, the, um, of one of the cycles in in higher co-dimension also. Indeed. Precisely. So that's why the torus vibration is nice and smooth. The Weishaus model is not smooth. Yes. So if we, if we are able to deal with singularities, we, we don't care. Otherwise, it might be better, wiser, to go to pass to the torus vibration to do computations. Yes. Okay, in the Weishaus model, of course, we, we introduce. Let me just for completeness write it down again. Maybe we don't need this since time is scarce. Fx z4 plus g z6 equals zero in a vibration in p 231 e By this I mean the this vibration of the coordinates x, y, z modulo the scaling relation over the base. Okay, so let's just briefly see where the section comes about. We know it because we say the section is a map that hits precisely the, the origin, so to speak, the, the marked point, the marked rational point on the fiber, and we know that this is just z equal to zero. So for, a, for all f and g, for all choices of f and g, there exists a rational point, so a point which only, whose definition only involves rational functions, in the fiber, which is given by, or a rational point actually, um, in the a rational point, <laughs> yeah, in the fiber, but I mean, I, I, just about the notation, but I, I think we'll see what we mean. So given by PW equals zero, this is my elliptic vibration, and then I cut out in this a locus Z equal to zero. So when I put Z equal to zero, then I have X and Y, I have one rescaling uh, relation between X, Y, and Z, and I can use this to arrange for X and Y to be one. in the fiber. So over each, that's why I, I hesitated now, over each point in the base, over each point in the base, this defines for me a point in the fiber. Over each point in the base. So this is this extra point which always exists. And it's in the notes, so uh, I mean it's probably clear, but it's in the notes how to see that indeed this is just one point. So the locus S0 given by Z equals to zero, this is a divisor, a one complex, one complex co-dimension object in the full vibration given by precisely this point in the fiber is a section on Y n plus one and it intersects the fiber in one point. Let me precisely this point. So the earlier, like, would have to also zero or something? You said for all, 
Where for all f and g, well, that's always fine. No, I mean, th that point always exists. Yeah, if, if, I mean, if z is 0, then this goes away. And then we just have y squared equals x cubed. Uh, okay, okay. And that precisely corresponds after rescaling to one point. Okay. So we have the situation that we have here, the, the space, Bn, and we have the elliptic fiber over it. And over each point in the base, so here we have another elliptic fiber, different shape. Over each of those points in the base, over each point, there is one point in the fiber that I can label by saying this is z equal to 0 intersecting the fiber. And that's what the section is. It's a map that maps each point in the base to this point in the fiber. And we'll see in a second why this section, what the, what the physical role of the section is in, in m theory duality, fm theory duality. Okay, so of particular importance in elliptic vibrations, question? No. No. Both from the math and from the physics are those loci on Bn over which the elliptic fiber may become singular. So the fiber E tau becomes singular. Whenever we have Pw equals zero, that puts us puts us on the Weierstrass model as such, and also the gradient of Pw equals zero with respect to coordinates x, y, or z vanishes. That's the definition of a singularity. When you have a hypersurface in some space, then this hypersurface acquires a singularity. A singularity means that you cannot define the tangent space to a point, and this, this is so if the gradient vanishes, because then you don't know how to move again out of this point. That's what a singularity is. So a singularity of the fiber is one where the gradient vanishes in the fiber directions. So dp with respect to x and y or z is zero. At one point in the fiber. And this happens this happens whenever the discriminant delta, which is 4f cubed plus 27g squared, equals 0. That's the discriminant. So note f and g are now, we have an elliptic vibration, so f and g vary over the base as sections of a bundle. And there will be points where they satisfy this relation. And when this happens, then dp is zero. And I'm giving you the proof in the notes. The statement is si simply that such a singular, such uh, um, this dp equals zero occurs when some of the roots, when two or more roots of the cubic in x here coincide. And this, by definition, is what happens when the discriminant of that cubic vanishes. And this is precisely the discriminant of that cubic. So you can, similarly to what happens when the two roots of a quadratic equation, they coincide when its discriminant vanishes. Here, these are roots of the cubic equation, x cubed plus x, essentially plus constant. So this is a condition which happens in complex co-dimension one on the base. So in complex co-dimension one, there will be points where this condition is satisfied. This happens 
over complex co-dimension co-dimension 1 loci in the base Bn. So we will have a situation where the fiber and there's here some locus where d delta equals zero on the f in Bn and over these points something terrible will happen to the fiber. The fiber will be singular at one point and this is usually drawn in this way. There is one singular point in the fiber over those points in the base. Now, suppose f and g are generic functions on the base. Generic in the sense that they are sections of a particular bundle, so they, they have to sit in a particular class, but I take all polynomials in that class such that f and g are maximally generic, so they don't have any particular, any particular weird form. So for f and g generic, the locus delta equals zero on the base, this cuts out a connected divisor, so co-dimension one object on Bn, which I drew already here. If, if f and g were non-generic, then it could be that it factors into several ones. And we'll discuss this in a second, but first let's stick to that case. So let's now look at what happens over this discriminant divisor in the base. So at a generic point, on the discriminant delta, we have that on delta equals zero, we have that delta equals zero, but f and g by themselves will not be zero. This is at the generic point. So if I pick a random, pick a random point on this discriminant, then only the discriminant will vanish because I put myself there. But f and g individually will not vanish. Question? Um, it, um, no. It does not go through those similarities. <coughs> That's important. And we'll, we'll come to this. So at generic points, um, uh, bah, 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 and the torus becomes a singular object, it forms a so-called nodal curve. So you can, let's, let's take it, um, let's take a real projection, so to speak, of that complex curve. It's an object which self-intersects once. This is also what I tried to, to, uh, try to, to draw here. So this is now one complex dimension. It's just a curve which self-intersects once. This is called a node. And this fiber is called the I1 fiber. That's just the name in Kodaira's classification of possible singularities. So this is the situation which happens, by the, by, as we just said, over generic points. So where delta vanishes to order one, that's the vanishing order of the discriminant, but f and g do not vanish. So they vanish to order zero. This means that they do not vanish. So that's the situation. So when f and g do not vanish, but, the delta, but delta vanishes just to order one, it's just some polynomial equals to zero, then the fiber over this just becomes singular in the sense that it has one singular point where a self-intersection of this type occurs, called nodal, nodal curve. So IE e tau is singular at one point of self-intersection.
But, and this is important, what vanishes here is only the gradient in direction x, y, z. So you can check this, dp x, y, z vanishes, but dp is non-zero in direction of the base coordinates. So the gradient in the, in the directions normal to the elliptic fiber is not zero. So this means that the elliptic fiber is singular, but the vibration, but the manifold y n plus 1 is smooth. So therefore, y n plus 1 is smooth. That's why a Weierstrass model where f and g are generic in that sense are, is called a smooth Weierstrass model. So there are singularities in the fiber, but they are not singularities of the full geometry. Say again? Not zero. Absolutely. Thank you. Good, 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 good. We'll come to this. It goes to I infinity, and this is because there's a seven brain there, but we'll discuss that. Okay, so I think now time to switch to this. So before I come to this physical interpretation, let me just complete this classification, little classification. This is just for completeness now, but I want to do it. So just for completeness, let's go to the locus on delta. So we said on the generic point of delta, f and g uh, of delta equals zero, f and g do not vanish. But of course, there can be a point where both delta equals zero and f equals zero. That's a non-generic, higher co-dimension. At this point, also g vanishes because delta is f cubed plus g squared. So at, this is just for completeness now, but let me briefly bring it. At f equals zero and g equals zero, this is co-dimension two on the base, again with f and g generic. Also delta equals zero, which is four f cubed plus 23 j equals zero. And in fact, it vanishes now to order two because this goes like x squared, x to zero, x some coordinate, not the fiber. This one likes x cubed, so it has an overall x2. So it vanishes to order two. So we have now the situation order f, order g, order delta equals one, one, two. The elliptic fiber at this point where f and g is zero, takes just the form y squared equals x cubed. And this turns out is, again, a singular curve. It's a cuspidal singular curve. It's a cusp, something that touches itself at the singular point, cuspidal curve. So again, one point of self-intersection, but in this tangent way, because y squared equals x cubed. So f and g take generic functional form. It's a generic functional form, but nonetheless I can now look at what happens when f equal to zero and g equal to zero simultaneously. But without enforcing this by saying, I, so for example, not generic, not generic would be f equals omega times f, f primed and g equals omega times g primed. This would not be generic because it factorizes. It would satisfy this, but in a bad way. But it could, right? So if it's a generic function, it will, there will still be zeros, but not enforced by such, by, uh, by such factorization. Or any further relations. There can also be more subtle relations between f and g, such that the uh, coefficients of the polynomial c are related to coefficients of polynomials there. So I, I take random coefficients of all polynomials. So, and just for completeness, this is called type 2 fiber in Kodaira's classification. And again, we have the same 
situation e tau is singular but y n plus 1 is smooth ok so the conclusion is the smooth Weierstrass model so if I take a Weierstrass model with f and g generic then I can have two type, three types of fibers I can have the generic fiber I can have the fiber where delta is 0 but f and g don't looks like this or I could have this specialization where f and g both vanish if I took an elliptic vibration not in Weierstrass form then this list would be longer then I would find more types of fibers this re related on the Weierstrass form this is meant by the statement that um, up to higher code these are effects in co dimension up to co dimension effects they are the same so for note an elliptic vibration in non Weierstrass form in non Weierstrass form has additional types so a, 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 sorry I should say a smooth elliptic vibration so smooth in the sense that y n plus 1 is smooth okay in non Weierstrass form has additional um, singular fiber types in co-dimension and therefore agrees with the Weierstrass model only up to those co-dimensional laws that was what I meant okay so that was the classification of the smooth model and now we come to the physics that's of course crucial finally the physics what does this mean And we'll give an interpretation first in the 2B picture and then in the M theory picture and see how they match. So, physics interpretation. Via type 2B. So, the statement is that this locus delta equals zero is the location of the seven brains why is that by doing precisely what you suggested looking at what tau does at those points and see how this matches with the supergravity solution of seven brains with which we started so to this end recall that given a Weierstrass model we can read off tau via this Jacobi J function so there is a function J of tau which is a modular form and this is related in the Weierstrass model so this is not the definition of the function there is a function J of tau which in the Weierstrass model turns out to equal um, we had it on the board already 4f cubed over delta where delta is precisely this discriminant 4f cubed plus 27g squared and this j of tau enjoys an expansion in e to the 2 pi i tau of the type e to the minus 2 pi i tau plus order 1 744 plus then 196 what okay I don't have it on here 196 something times order very good e to the 2 pi i tau famous number plus higher order terms in two e to the 2 pi i so if tau I mean th this is now a heuristic argument if tau goes to if tau if j of tau goes to infinity plus infinity then this is consistent with tau going to i infinity so j of tau 
to infinity is consistent with tau goes to i infinity. Like this. And indeed, at an i1 locus, so this generic point, f is non-zero, delta goes to zero, so this goes to real infinity. So this is what happens at an i1 locus. J of tau goes to infinity, this is finite by zero. So tau is consistent with tau going to i infinity. So tau was C0 plus i over Gs. And we now compare this to situation uh, in, in, um, for a seven brain. For a seven brain, um, we had that uh, we had a logarithmic profile, ln 1 over 2 pi i ln z. And that's precisely consistent with this behavior. We see at the I1 locus, this is the one where f is finite, tau goes to I infinity, so gs goes to zero, and this is the behavior near a single D7 brain, or one zero brain, because we had at the beginning tau of z minus z zero equals one over two pi i ln z minus z0 plus blah, 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 blah. There is also another way of saying the same thing. That would be the better way, but it would involve more machinery that I don't want, can't introduce now. Really, the seven brain is defined by its monodromy on tau. And one can check that singular fibers of that type have precisely that monodromy. So this is part of the Kodaira classification. If you go, if you evolve the elliptic fiber around a singular fiber, its, one, its two cycles, the two one cycles, undergo a monodromy, which is precisely the SL to Z monodromy. And this way you can one-to-one -one pin it down. This is kind of, I mean, I, I don't know how much you trust this argument here. It's consistent with, but maybe not one-to-one, -one, or it takes more time to show it at least. But it gives the right result. And with the monodromies it works. It works explicitly. So more interesting, and I have not much to say about this, is the type 2 locus. So there we have j of tau is 0 by 0. So it's indefinite. It's not clear what it is. Indefinite. So here the monodromy argument would be better. And it turns out that this is a remnant, so to speak. This is something that happens in co-dimension 2 anyway, a remnant of, if you're familiar with this, the O7 plane in 2B language. So it's a locus on the brain where some of the remnant of the O7 plane can still be seen in this way. So it's a non-perturbative locus. The usual one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends on, depends on your notation, yes. The one with negative... Everything negative, yes. Negative tension, negative charge. The usual, yeah, exactly. Okay, I give you, f for this, I give you also a reference 09081572. Okay. And note, good. So, the statement is, from the discriminant locus, one can read off the location of the seven brains. And that is very useful. We had the question of why is, F, uh, why is elliptic vibration useful? Because without thinking, we simply compute where delta is zero and then we know where the seven brains are. 
And this is guaranteed to be a consistent configuration. If we thought about seven brains without this language, then we would have to think very hard which types of brains can be consistently put together, these different types of PQ brains, which unfortunately I discussed only very briefly. They cannot simultaneously be present in a consistent way in all cases, and it's in general not known how to describe this consistently other than in this way. So the elliptic vibration automatically gives rise to the correct and consistent brain configurations. Yes, 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 yes. All of this is coming. You can? This is where matter lives. And um, the gauge group, we have a seven brain, what's the gauge group? So in this case, as we see with F and G generic, we have just a single, a single bound state of seven brains in O7 planes. And it turns out that um, the gauge group is trivial. So naively, you, you might think that you might have a U1 gauge group because you have one seven brain. But this is really um, uh, projected out if you think in terms of type 2b by, an ori by, an, by an, uh, the non-perturbative version of the orientifold projection. So the gauge group um, G is trivial. So you would have um, a single, you have a single bound state, non-perturbative bound state of a D7 brain with O7, the O7 minus plane, and um, the would be U1 is projected out. So it would be very interesting to discuss this in, great de in greater detail. This is very, I mean, this statement at least is understood. One can discuss this by, by looking at the so-called set limit. I'd love to do this, but we don't have time. I'll give references where this is discussed. So th this is a very uh, entertaining exercise. Um, if the D7 brain is in the class 8 times the O7 plane, it does. They are not homologous. They are one is in class 8 times the other. Yes, but, co but um, not eight separate D7 brains, but one D7 brain in class 8 times O7. So it, it, it wraps a divisor, which is in the homology class, eight times the other. And then it's, then it's fine. Upstairs, in the upstairs picture. So the gauge group is zero. OK. So we are still practicing, right? This is, the f this is a smooth vibration in the sense discussed. But we, we will then see that, um, in more, um, that there will, of course, also be situations with non-trivial gauge group. And then the full power of this will become apparent. Still, let's do this, the physics um, interpretation in M theory. No. I'm only saying that if F and G are generic, then this describes configurations of D-brains in which there is no gauge group. So this is all for F and G generic. Okay. So F and G generic. We'll discuss the non-generic cases. As, uh, 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 next, but first I need to um, describe how to how we um, how we understand this in M theory. Again, this is all preparation then for the singular case, but whatever we learn now will be useful. Then. So, in M theory, there is no seven brain. So what's the origin of would-be gauge theory of, of would-be gauge symmetry from the M theory perspective? So in the effective action of M theory compactified of this elliptic vibration, gauge potentials come from dimensional reduction of the three-form potential of supergravity, 
with respect to harmonic forms. So in the effective theory in R1 a minus 2n, if we compactify m theory, so we have that the gauge symmetry comes from the reduction of the m theory tree form gauge potential C3. That's crucial. Namely, we decompose C3 in terms of a one form wedge, a two form, where the one form lives here, this will be a gauge potential, the two form lives on the internal space, and in order for this one form to be massless, the two form must be harmonic. So we need a basis of harmonic two forms on the smooth, we call for F and G generic, we have the smooth Calabria Y n plus 1. So the harmonic ones H2 of Y n plus 1. So since we are on a Calabria space, this is the same as H11 Y n plus 1. There are no two zero forms. And since this is an elliptic vibration, every 1-1 one, one form on the base is also a 1-1 one, one form on the full space. So we have H11 of the base. And then, and this is now where the section finally comes in, plus 1, because this is this section. So here we have a basis, the alpha, on the base. So base divisors and their dual two forms. And here this would be the class of the section. If you had several sections, then you would have several such classes. But for now, we just have one section by assumption. So we can now look at the expansion of C3 in terms of those two forms, which are live on the base, and this extra section, and see what it gives. So we can expand C3 equals H0, A0, match S0, plus some over all alpha from 1 up to H11 of the base times A alpha wedge D alpha B. We do this expansion and A0 and A alpha will now be massless one forms in the M theory effective action. So in the M theory they look like gauge potentials So this seems to be in contradiction to what we said about the 2B perspective. But the key point is that we have now to compare very carefully those fields with their type to be counterparts upon doing this F to M theory duality. We now need to relate. Oh, yeah, okay. So in M theory, we see that we have a gauge group U1 to the H11BN plus 1 in M theory. But needs to relate these to F theory. on Bn in R1 8 minus 2n times the circle. And then we see the following. We see two things. First of all, these one form potentials, they are associated with two forms in the base. So what else in type to B now is associated with two forms in the base? If we think a bit, we know that we have a four-form potential in the Ramon-Ramon sector of type 2b. We can also expand it along a two-form, and we get then a two-form potential in type 2b. If we take this two-form potential and take one leg along the one cycle, we get a one-form, and this is precisely the one-form potential we saw there. So in other words, those which come from dB alpha are not gauge groups, 
in type 2b in F theory, but they are just the tensors which I get from reduction of C4 on the same uh, two forms on the, fiber, on the base. So these A alpha come from two form tensors, B alpha 2, from C4 equals B alpha 2 wedge D alpha B, some alpha, where this is the Raman Raman form potential in 2B after reduction on S1 B tilde. So we match those one forms to actually tensors in type 2B. So they are not gauge groups in the F theory limit. They are gauge groups in M theory, but not in F theory. So that already shows us how the effective action of F and M theory can be very different. And second, and this is even more subtle, what about A0? Well, one does a circle reduction from 2B in order to get to M theory. The circle reduction automatically gives rise to a color cycline U1. And A0 is precisely that color cycline U1, which is there in the M theory, but of course not in the F theory, which is one dimension higher because we decompactify that circle. So this is related to the color cycline U1 from circle reduction. So more precisely, and okay, let me just tell you that more precisely one has to shift the zero section by one half of the canonical class on the base. If we do this, then the corresponding A zeros is, is the KK U1. That's the technicality which will play no role for us. I give you the reference one 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 two three five one. But that's just a technicality that has to do with some of the peculiarities. So we see that the M theory gauge group is much larger than the F theory gauge group. And if we subtract those, then we see that indeed in F theory we have no gauge group left in agreement. And again, note that this section here, A0, the zero section, is precisely related to this Kaluza Klein U1. So we have no D brain U1 in F theory limit. Okay, so this was just this toy model of a smooth Weierstrass model. The next step, which we will do next time, will be to look at more complicated vibrations where F and G take a non-generic form. Then the list of singular fibers grows. And then we will find gauge symmetry, both in type 2B, because it corresponds to a non-trivial D-brain configuration, and in M-theory, because we will find new two forms, essentially. So the game in M-theory is really, f give me all the two forms, and then you know about the gauge symmetry. And we'll discuss this. This will involve the Kodaira um, classification of, of singularities. And then we'll also see higher co-dimension singularities, which then give rise to matter. But review maybe this afternoon this, this logic um, in that context, because it will just be a, a theme with variations for the, um, also for the proper and interesting case then with uh, non abelian gauge symmetry. Okay, so even if we do, so again, so there is a prescription to go, fr to go from the torus vibration to the Weierstrass vibration called Jacobian construction in the uh, um, arithmetic geometry literature. So even if one did not have an elliptic vibration in that sense, but only a torus vibration, on every torus vibration you have not a section, but a multi-section. So you have a map from the base to several points in the fiber, which gets 
intertwined by monodromies. In those cases, instead, you simply replace this S0 by the class of that multi-section. And this will still, so in particular this formula here, will still hold. This one now corresponds not to the class of the zero section, but the class of the multi-section. And likewise does the calusa klein u1. So for, for, uh, um, from that perspective, it makes really no difference. Um, the so the physics is that the, t the torus vibration, so the elliptic vibration, what, what is, the, okay, so, so the vibration, the geometry as such, sees the effective action of the M theory, not of the F theory, because to the F theory we have to go to this uh, artificial limit. Now in, the, in an M theory, we have, in the M theory effective action, we have degrees of freedom, Wilson lines, precisely around this extra um, circle from type 2b to M theory, which we can switch on. And in particular, when there can be discrete Wilson lines, um, discreetly many that can be switched on, which give rise to different um, vacua in the M theory perspective, all of which become equivalent in the F theory limit, because I forget about this full S1 vibration. And there can now be situations where a model in M theory sits has, has, has matter, so, so, so the elliptic vibration describes a model where there is matter in M theory which is not charged under any U1 gauge group and which describes a different phase of this Wilson line compared to the torus vibrations. So, and the statement then is that since you have charged matter, uh, since you have matter which is not charged under any, U, uh, under any U1, you cannot go to the Coulomb branch and resolve. This is a phenomenon which is exemplified there, but more general. And I actually wanted to discuss this the next time when we, when we discuss the singularity. So the statement is the, the, the res so having, having a singularity means you have matter localized, which is not charged under any U1. So there is no direction in the Coulomb branch which can make it massive without breaking supersymmetry. And that's precisely the statement that there cannot be a resolution. But we'll discuss this. We'll discuss this. Yeah, yeah. Too, right? Perfect. Yes, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, I didn't want to discuss any of this. Um, <laughs> it was indeed. This is what what will be discussed on Friday. Yes. Yes. Um, actually, I wanted to discuss tomorrow the Weierstrass form singular, the singular Weierstrass form, okay. and look at those singularities. Again, reserving the non Weierstrass models to, to the Friday lecture. Okay. Up to, up to birational, uh, up to differences in the higher core dimension. So this means that, that th th there will be two types of vibrations. Which, which agree everywhere except for, say, co dimension two points and in the base and the fiber over this. And then the, the type of this other vibration, which is not in Weichler's form, will, will, have, will, will have a fiber type which is not in this Kodaira's list. And th th that's, yeah, that's the solution. Well, maybe one more question, yes? So, what do you mean by the one half? What do you mean by fraction? Um, this is in H11R, so indeed, it doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah, it's in H11R. I'm only looking at the, at the massless mode.